Thanks so much, Dale. We'll return to our top story, and that's the announcement made by US President Donald Trump just a moment ago that he is withdrawing the US from the landmark Paris Climate Agreement. Josh Frydenberg is the Environment and Energy Minister, and he joins me in the studio now for his immediate reaction. Minister, good morning. Nice to be with you, Virginia. Your response to Donald Trump's statement. Well, I've spoken to our Prime Minister this morning, who's just landed in Singapore, and we reiterate our full commitment to the Paris Accord. We believe that the targets we agreed to, a 26 to 28 per cent reduction in our emissions by 2030 on 2005 levels, are reasonable, are achievable. We will beat them, just as we beat our first Kyoto target, and we're on track to beat our second Kyoto target, the, two, the 2020 target, by 224 million tonnes. But do we actually now have that hailed international agreement when the historically largest emitter, the US, has now withdrawn? Well, the US is not the world's largest emitter today. It's H the second largest emitter. Historically, it's the largest and emitter. It, and it's still a very significant emitter. About 20%, I think. About 16% of the world's emissions. Uh, the biggest emitter is China. Um, China, India, Japan, a number of other trading partners of Australia have reiterated their commitment in recent days. I noticed that the business community in the US, the big energy companies, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, here in Australia, BHP, Dow, they all reiterate their commitment to Paris as well. Yet you've got the, the President pulling them out. So just to repeat the question, do you actually have a meaningful international agreement without the US? I do believe it is still a very meaningful agreement. You had more than 190 countries sign on, and in record time, 146 countries have ratified. So even without the US, around 70% of the world's emissions are covered by that agreement. Minister, you wouldn't be sitting here this morning saying it was a good agreement if Paris had been signed overnight and the US was absent from it. So to flip the question, we can't sit here and say that this is a good outcome. It's clearly preferable to have the US at the table. Oh, more than preferable. It's essential, isn't it? Well, it's important to have all the major emitters of the world participating in agreements such as this. But Australia will do its part. We represent about 1.3%, 1.4% of the world's emissions. And if you count up all those countries who have emissions production under 2%, that makes up 40% of the total international emissions profile. That's why what Australia does is important too. But this is the, the President who, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, said that climate change was a conspiracy created by China. When you have that kind of anti-scientific uh, view abroad, what does it mean though for an international discussion about lowering emissions and lowering the Earth's temperature? I think there's a broad global understanding, Virginia, about the significance of climate change. And here in Australia... But one that exempts the, the leader of the free world. Well, if you look at the United States economy, it is transitioning to a lower emissions future. It's got its lowest emissions intensity in more than 20 years. And one of the reasons for that has been the shale gas revolution, which has seen gas overtake coal as a major energy source. But here in Australia, we are at our lowest emissions intensity on a GDP on a per capita basis in 27 years. So Australia is transforming and we are supporting that transition in a way that ensures energy affordability and energy security. But if you don't have a binding international agreement that includes the US, such a large emitter and a powerful force, just on one level, that surely spells the death knell for something like the Great Barrier Reef if we can't get those ocean temperatures down. Well, clearly climate change is a major threat to the Barrier Reef and that's why Australia, like so many other countries, are participating in global efforts. But OK, so, so just to follow that on from that then, follows logically that if you don't then have an incredibly large emitter like the US as part of that agreement, and if that climate change is spelling the death knell for the Great Barrier Reef, that goes on. The key point here is we are reducing emissions as a globe. You're not actually answering my question. But the, but the key point is we are reducing emissions as a globe. The US is. If you ask me, is it preferable to have the US at the table? Absolutely. No, I'm asking you if it's essential for the survival of the Great Barrier Reef. Well, I think it's important for the overall reduction in global emissions to have the US participating. They are doing a number of things. Donald Trump's announcement today is obviously very significant, but Australia will carry on because as our Prime Minister has made very clear, when we sign up to international agreements, when we ratify them, as the Prime Minister Julie Bishop and I announced just a day after Donald Trump was elected, very significant time that we chose, uh, we will follow through. Now, how can you and your Prime Minister describe yourselves as an innovative government and one also that believes in the effectiveness of science when you've ruled out any kind of emissions intensity scheme before you've even received that crucial final report from the Chief Scientist Alan Finkel? 
Well, an emissions intensity scheme, for those who understand it, means that generators who are producing above a certain amount are punished. Now, in this case, that it's, would... it's about putting a price on carbon, which 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 most uh, serious commentators acknowledge has to take place in some form or another. There has to be some kind of price signal. But there's already an implicit price on carbon. If you look at our emissions reduction fund, where we've ploughed more than two billion dollars into, we're actually been reducing. That's the uh, price on carbon. Well, well at eleven dollars eighty-three per tonne of abatement, we have reduced. 189 million tonnes. The renewable energy target, which is driving a record spend in Australia on renewable energy, is in fact effectively putting an implicit price on carbon. Well, we can argue about that, but let's not lose time on it. Let's go back to the question, <laughs> which is, if you and the Prime Minister believe in the effectiveness of scientists and also your chief scientist, Alan Finkel, why do you make this major policy change before you've even received his final report? Well, the Finkel report will be absolutely critical and the reason why we commissioned Not it... if you've already ruled out any kind of emissions well, intensity scheme. let's just see what he produces, Virginia. But the point about an emissions intensity scheme, and it is a complicated one and a lot of people jump at names but don't understand the detail, is that actually it would push out faster than the system can cope brown and black coal generators. And right now, after we saw the blackout in South Australia, which was a disaster for the people and the businesses of that state, we can't afford to compromise energy security and energy affordability. That's why it's a trilemma that we face. Now, the decision just finally this morning from Donald Trump, does it require then, in order for our emissions reduction to be effective, to actually achieve something meaningful for our part of the world and the planet more generally, does it require bolder policy? from this government and are you prepared to do that? No, we believe that the 26 to 28 per cent target that we have taken on is reasonable and is achievable. I point out that the Labor Party have a 45 per cent emissions reduction target. We think that's too high and that would damage the energy security and the energy affordability of Australians. We're not prepared to do that. We're much more realistic, we're much more reasonable and we will beat and meet our targets for 2030, just as we've done previously. Minister, thanks for joining me today. Good to be with you. Thank you.